I don't like making ensemble movies, although I've only made ensemble movies. 99% of the films I've made are ensemble. I don't know why I do that to myself. I try not to make negative videos if I can avoid it because I prefer putting my time and energy into the things that I enjoy. But Rebel Moon was the last movie I saw in the cinema in 2023 and it annoyed me so much that I just had to get all of my thoughts about it off my chest and also get my ticket money back with the ad revenue from this video. That's right, I didn't just watch it on Netflix but actually bought a ticket to see it at my local art house in 70mm because I wanted to like this movie. I love it whenever an original genre flick actually gets greenlit by a major studio and while I didn't expect it to have the same impact on sci-fi as Star Wars or Avatar, I still went into this movie in good faith. Because I think for the most part Zack Snyder makes good looking movies and directs cool fight scenes so I figured Rebel Moon would at least be an enjoyable couple of hours of easy sci-fi action with laser swords and spaceships. Yeah, it wasn't. But look, this isn't going to be some anti-Snyder rant where I go on and on about lens flares and slow motion. Okay, well I talk about the slow motion a bit, but this video goes into a bit more nuance than that. Because let's get this out of the way up front. Rebel Moon isn't terrible because it's a Zack Snyder movie. It's terrible because it's the most poorly written big budget movie I have seen since Rise of Skywalker. But at least Rise of Skywalker looked like a movie and not a video game cutscene. And don't get me wrong here, I am not at all against mindless, fun genre movies that wink at the audience and tell us not to care too much about the story or the characters, just have fun with how cool everything is. But Rebel Moon doesn't see itself as a fun sci-fi action adventure. No, it's a movie that takes itself so seriously that it's painful, that treats every single moment with this weird false reverence, and thinks that pumping itself full of lore and world building can compensate for the fact that its characters have about the same amount of depth as this shot's focal length. And because of that, it ends up being a team-up movie with characters that are so generic, uninteresting and hollow that it fails to do the one thing a team-up movie is meant to do. Find a character to, to puzzle piece in to each of the roles and to make a cohesive team. Don't agree with me? Well, here's a clip of Zack Snyder himself describing one of the characters in this movie. Seasoned warrior who has a sort of a mysterious past. Now, you tell me which of these characters he's talking about. Is he talking about the mysterious, stoic and reluctant warrior? Or is he talking about the mysterious, stoic and reluctant warrior with laser swords? Maybe. But don't forget about the next member of the team, the mysterious, stoic and reluctant warrior with long hair. And of course, the siblings, both of whom are mysterious, stoic and reluctant warriors. Surprise, he was actually talking about the protagonist of the movie, who you will be surprised to learn is a mysterious, stoic and reluctant warrior. But we're getting ahead of ourselves, and look, if you liked this movie, then I'm not here to try and change your mind. Sincerely, good on you for liking it, I'm happy you have a new story in your life that you get to enjoy, and I hope you're excited for the sequel. Go and watch another video, this one isn't for you. But for those of you who are sticking around and feel the need to defend the movie in the comments, well I think I already know what you're going to say, which is something along the lines of, it's only part one, and or, wait for the director's cut. On the first point, my response is simply that being part one doesn't excuse any of the problems I have with this movie. Dune was also a part one, and that did a hell of a better job than this did of setting up its world, characters, and story. As for the argument that we need to wait for the extended director's cut, well, to that I say no. Not this time. See, usually, a director's cut is released when the director felt their original vision for the movie was compromised by studio interference or some other external factors. And this of course famously happened to Snyder with Justice League and he was eventually able to release his version of that movie which was vastly superior to the original. But that's not what is happening here. For a start, Snyder doesn't see the director's cut of Rebel Moon as the same movie. The R-rated version of this movie and, and the PG-13 almost are like alternate universes of the same story, you know? Sure. It's almost an alternative reality version okay. of that movie. When you are planning to make a theatrical cut and a director's cut right from the beginning, then you don't get to dismiss criticism of your theatrical cut on the grounds of, oh, but it'll be better in the director's cut. The theatrical version was still Zack Snyder's vision. It has his name on it and he had a huge amount of creative control, and so we are justified criticizing this movie as he decided to release it. Look, and I'm super proud of the PG-13 version of the movie. I really am. I've 
think it's really fun and it's clean and cool. Put it this way. I, like most Lord of the Rings fans, think that the extended editions are the definitive versions of those movies. The filmmakers knew that the story would be better when presented in the longer format, but they also knew that a shorter theatrical version would need to be released, and so they still put the effort into making those movies masterpieces in their own right. It's not like Snyder made Rebel Moon, then Netflix came in and told him to cut a load of stuff out. He knew he was making two versions from the start, so even if the director's cut is better, that does not excuse the theatrical version for being as bad as it is. You can't have it both ways. Also, as far as I can tell, the only studio mandate he was really under for the theatrical cut of Rebel Moon was to make it PG-13. What's cool is in the R-rated version when he goes, <sighs> he exhales the smoke, but we just couldn't do it because it's not. <laughs> you can't show smoking in PG-13. And I don't think the problem with Rebel Moon was that it didn't have enough sex and violence. The problem with Rebel Moon was that it was a terribly written story with paper thin characters that is the epitome of why every writer has it drilled into them to show not tell. So in this video I'm going to show you exactly what I mean by that but also try to offer some constructive criticism of how small changes to the story and characters could have made this movie so much better. And just to be extra fair to Daddy Snyder, when the director's cut does come out then I'll make a follow up video that will be available exclusively to my Patreon supporters. My hopes are not high for that movie but you know what they say about suffering for your art. Anyway the reason I found Rebel Moon frustrating enough to make a nearly hour long video about it was that it had everything going for it. A big budget, an original story, a major distributor and a strong creative lead. It is so rare these days for someone in Hollywood to have those sorts of resources to deliver an original movie like this. And Rebel Moon just squandered all of that by delivering the most generic, poorly written movie I have seen in a very long time. Zack Snyder is capable of so much better than this, so please indulge me as I absolutely eviscerate Rebel Moon hyphen part one colon a child of fire. But before we get into that, let me quickly say what I liked about this movie. Firstly, the score was great. Tom Holkenborg has worked with Snyder for a long time and has composed some pretty awesome pieces of music, including the score for Fury Road, which is one of my all-time favourites. He brought his A-game to Rebel Moon and wrote a score that really captured the space opera epic tone that Snyder was going for. I genuinely mean it when I say that this is the best thing about the movie. Next, the costume design is fantastic. Everything looks brilliant and it's refreshing to see real actors in proper costumes instead of CG armies. It's like a mix of Warhammer 40k and Firefly and it's an aesthetic I am 100% here for. Also I don't care what Edna says, capes are always cool no matter what the movie is. Thumbs up for capes. Another thing is the cast. Snyder has always been good at casting and I think most of the actors, not you, did the best they could with the material they had. Sophia Boutella brings an intensity to her role and definitely carries the movie and even though Ed Screen is doing his best Christoph Waltz impression, I think he pulled it off for the most part. Getting Anthony Hopkins to voice the robot was a good move and I've liked Charlie Hunman ever since I saw him in The Gentleman. I also thought that the final fight between Noble and Cora was pretty cool. Next is, oh wait, that's it. That's the end of my list of things that I liked about Rebel Moon. As for what I didn't like about Rebel Moon, well it's simple really. Everything. I think there are the bones of a really good story here. Because at its core, the story is one that has already been done brilliantly several times before. Zack Snyder clearly has a genuinely strong vision for what he wants this to be, and is obviously passionate about bringing a new sci-fi world to life. I just wish he had brought a writer on board to help lift the story, dialogue and characters up to a standard worthy of that vision. So let's start at the beginning, literally the beginning where we see the bad guy's ship coming out of a space vagina, imagery that, knowing Snyder, was 100% intentional. We're then treated to an exposition dump before we go down to Velt and meet Korra, our hero, and her sidekick Gunnar, played by Dario from Game of Thrones. Now most of the first act of Rebel Moon is fine. It's formulaic sure, but it's perfectly acceptable as an opening to a movie, even though all of the dialogue is basically just a series of cliches interspersed with long and clunky dumps of exposition. A senator named Belisarius used the opportunity to seize power. It is my duty as the head of this community to remind you that the gods of the harvest demand a tribute. The two seasons I've spent here have given me happiness. We can have a cup of ale and I will tell you about life here. The rebels we seek have been attacking our supply ports, led by a woman named Deborah Bloodaxe. Once the king was killed, I just laid down their weapons and refused to fight. When I found you in the wreckage of that ship. Do you know the story of our slain king and his beautiful daughter? 
Wait, how long is this? That she, as prophesied, had been born of flesh and blood into our... Nope, still going. Okay, you know what? You get the point. Oh, by the way, some of the clips from the movie will need to be edited or sped up slightly so that this video doesn't get copyright claimed, but you'll get the idea. Consider it a homage to Snyder's speed ramping. Anyway, the clunkiness of all of these cliches and exposition is less irritating at this point in the story because we don't yet realise that the entire movie is going to be characters talking like this. So you were a soldier for the mother world? When they first came to my world, I was nine years old. I'm no friend of the realm, that's well known. We represent a village on a small bone called Velt. I told you how I fought on countless worlds. For my loyalty and service, I was promoted to the elite guard of the royal family. Did you command the eastern ranks for the old king? Who's going to make sure you'll return in one piece? After the death of an admiral, protocol would demand the ship's return. But while all of this was going on, I couldn't help but think how flat and boring this all looked. So you can imagine my surprise to learn that this was a real set. Look at how colourless and textureless the backgrounds are in these shots. I thought it looked like the Star Wars shows filmed in the volume, and when I was watching it, all I could think of was, why didn't they film this on location? Turns out they did. It's just filmed in a way that makes no effort to capture the authenticity, tactility, and depth of the environment. Anyway, back to the story, and the main thing we need to know is that Gunnar advocates for making a deal to sell the villagers' produce to the space Nazis, instead of their usual customers. We also learn that he had secretly sold grain to the Rebellion because it was more profitable. Cora intervenes briefly to warn the village against partnering with the Space Nazis, which Sindri agrees to. Remember this conversation. We're going to be coming back to it because so many of my problems with this movie come back to what we learn about the characters in this scene. The bad guys turn up and we meet the villain, Admiral Noble, played by Dario from Game of Thrones. Wait, what? That can't be right. Huh, that's funny. No wonder he's so mad at Gunnar. Anyway, he kills Sindri and demands the village supply his ship with food when they return, leaving behind a small gang of soldiers to keep an eye on them. Now before the plot gets going we need to put in some backstory because we haven't had any for about 30 seconds, so we see the evil soldiers doing cliche evil soldier stuff, during which time they also give us some exposition about the robot, then we have another exposition dump in what, to be fair, is the best looking scene of the movie. It's just a shame about the writing. Corporate needs you to find the differences between this picture. Do you know the story of our slain king and his beautiful daughter, the princess Issa? And this picture. Do you ever hear the tragedy of Darth Plagueis the Wise? They're the same picture. Meanwhile, the villagers argue about what to do, and decide they will cooperate with the bad guys and supply the grain in the hope that they will be shown mercy and left alone, prompting Cora to leave. As she does, she sees the soldiers assaulting the water girls, so she intervenes to stop them. There's a cool fight that ends like this. What are you waiting for? I gave you an order. Kill this By the way, five minutes earlier we were told this. You know they won't fight anymore, boss. What do you mean they won't fight anymore? Once the king was killed, lay down their weapons and refuse to fight. So never mind why this character ordered the robot to shoot despite knowing it won't fight, and also never mind commenting on the significance of the robot doing this anyway, because he just runs off into the second movie and the village turns up. We're gonna have to fight. After the village sees what Korra has done, she resolves to recruit an army with which they can fight back against the mother world's inevitable response. And here for me is the single biggest issue I have with this story and the character of Korra. There is no choice here. Sure, Korra does choose to defend the water girl and knows this will mean fighting the mother world, but she only does it because she happens to see it taking place. She was going to leave. She thinks fighting the mother world is a lost cause and will end with the village being wiped out. We know this because literally two minutes earlier she said, If I give them hope they fight and surely lose, I won't have that blood on my hands. So she changes her mind, yes, but what this means is her cause and fight becomes one of necessity, not choice. So when she goes around the galaxy recruiting people to her cause, it rings hollow because she herself is not doing it out of conviction or principle, but because she has no choice but to lead this fight. And more importantly, she deprives the village of the choice. And these are the villagers, they were showing up basically, you know, extend an olive branch to the soldiers, and then this is what they arrive to. All the soldiers are dead basically. They decided not to fight, but to cooperate. Now, that might be the wrong decision, but it was one made by the community together. Cora single-handedly robs them of that decision and forces them into a fight they do not want to have that she herself believes will get them all killed. So by single-handedly deciding to fight the mother world, Cora is basically saying to the villagers, Some of you may die, 
but it's a sacrifice I am willing to make. A much better arc would be Korra resolving from the start to fight. Remember, we did see Korra try to convince Sindri and Gunnar to lay low and hope they would be left alone. When that option got taken away from them, she just leaves when they decide to cooperate without saying anything. This scene was the opportunity for Korra to convince the villagers to fight. They had tried to appease the space Nazis and that had resulted in their beloved leader being murdered in front of them. So they have already seen how murderous and treacherous the mother world is, and now Korra could rally them to her side. She could share her own experiences and convince them that there will be no mercy. The only thing that she does have is this incredible perspective on what their intentions are. Rather than shying away and running off, Korra would take a stand and fight to defend the community that had taken her in. This would let us learn more about her past, but it would also establish her leadership skills and powers of persuasion. You know, skills that she will be relying on in the rest of the movie to rally others to her rebellion. And crucially, it would make Korra and the village active participants in the story, and proactively choose to fight together based on principle, not necessity. This may sound like a trivial distinction, but I disagree. I think if your story is one of rebellion and fighting for what is right, despite the overwhelming odds, it only has meaning if you choose to have that fight. Instead, the movie as it is written leaves us in a situation where the entire village does not want to fight, but are forced into having it by Korra, who at first wanted to abandon them. It's such a missed opportunity and makes me so frustrated to see Korra gallivanting around the galaxy trying to recruit people to fight based on honour and principle, when she herself did not choose to do that until she saw the soldiers assaulting the water girl. Now you might say that was symbolic of the oppression the mother world was capable of, but as we learn literally in the next scene, Korra is more familiar than anyone with what they can do. She says as much explicitly. You ask how I know that they'll destroy you. That's what I would do. So she doesn't need to see something like this to spur her into action. She should have this resolve from the start, or if she does need a reminder of what the mother world can do, then maybe, I don't know, this would be enough? The story as told makes her a passive actor in the narrative, and robs both her and the village of the chance to take a stand on principle. Anyway, moving on and Gunnar and Korra head off to try and contact the rebellion. For some reason, this soldier who he spent a whole scene getting to know and who actually stood up to his colleagues and fought with Korra simply vanishes and doesn't come on the adventure at all, despite being one of the more interesting and capable people we have seen in this movie. I guess he just ran off into the second movie with the robot? But never mind him, because while Korra and Gunnar are on their journey, Snyder again mistakes backstory for character development in a scene that, by my count, is the third time so far that the movie has stopped dead in its tracks to allow a character to literally narrate a huge chunk of backstory to us for several minutes. When they first came to my world, I was nine years old. I'm only telling you this so you know who I am. Again, this all would have been much more appropriate for Korra to say to the villagers, to convince them of why it was so important that they fight back, but no, we just have it told to us in a voiceover to give the illusion that this is a character focused scene. So that's bad enough, but it's made even worse by the fact that the writing is just so over the top that it just sounds insanely scripted. The Mother World's forces were commanded by a young general named Belisarius, who relished the ecstasy of combat, but he had served only to enrage the young general and gave him provocation to take out that anger on the innocent. Politics of expansion became too abstract, and the why of the conquest was lost in the sheer savagery of combat. No one talks like that, so it makes the awkwardness of all this exposition stand out even more than it already does. Oh, and before we get into the rest of the movie, let's talk about Gunnar. Here's what we know about Gunnar. Well, I'm no revolutionary. They offered the best price? I don't care about their cause. I don't have a side, only this community. That's my only loyalty. Now, I think this sounds like the interesting basis for a conflict of characters. Korra is determined to rebel against the mother world. Gunnar just wants to provide for his village and doesn't care about the bigger picture. Now, if Korra had actually convinced the village to fight, then Gunnar could have been the person disagreeing. After Korra and the village decided to fight, again, instead of being forced into it, then it would be understandable for Gunnar to reluctantly go along with Korra on her journey to recruit fighters, because he respects the will of the village, even if he personally disagrees. Instead, neither he nor anyone else ever challenges Korra for forcing them to have this fight or questions whether it is the right thing to do. Remember, Gunnar wanted to sell grain to the mother world. I'm simply saying maybe we can get a better price from our friends in low orbit there. So there might be a chance that we can spare a small amount. 
so this makes it all the more frustrating that he just blindly goes along with helping Korra. After this scene, we never see anything to indicate that Gunnar is some neutral, apathetic guy who only cares about selling his grain for a high price. Now that's because after this scene, Gunnar doesn't really do anything until this moment, but what the story should do is have this be a point of tension between the two protagonists throughout the movie. What the story should do is give Gunnar some sort of choice where he has to actively move away from being this guy. I don't have a side, only this community, that's my only loyalty. To someone who can see the value in a rebellion. You know like how Han chooses to come back and join the fight in Star Wars? This is really basic stuff that is the logical extension of these characters as they are set up in the first act, but the story just goes absolutely nowhere with them. Instead, the closest thing to a choice Gunnar has is this scene, where he saves Korra instead of paralyzing her. Now, what would have been interesting is for Noble to have recognized Gunnar from when they met in the village, and told him that he will let him go, forgive his crimes, leave the village in peace, and pay a ridiculous amount for their harvest, but first, Gunnar has to prove he is not a rebel by killing Korra. This would give Gunnar an actual choice, between getting everything he wants for his village, or choosing to actually rebel against the mother world. It would be a chance to show us how his character has grown over the story, and for him to prove that he is committed to the fight. This is the natural path for his character to take, but what does the movie do instead? Well, for some reason, Kai is the one to force him into paralyzing Korra, and bizarrely says this. I know you're in love with her. Now, the movie has kind of hinted at this, but it has never once shown us that Kai knows this. In fact, this is every exchange Kai and Gunnar have with each other in the entire movie before this point. Oh, I understand we're just simple farmers. Soldiers for a fight against the mother world. You ever been off planet? No. What did you do on the farm? Oh, I oversee the harvest, planting, cataloging seeds, and making sure that- That sounds great, you might want to hold that. Now is not the time to be a hero. But look, I think that's quite enough about the absolutely non-existent character arcs that Gunnar and Korra have in this movie. As you can tell by the runtime of this video, there's plenty more terrible writing where the protagonists came from. Because the second act is finally here and our heroes arrive at not the Mos Eisley Cantina. For the second time in about 10 minutes, we have an action scene based on the threat of sexual violence. But unlike the earlier scene, this one is not earned. It's entirely shoehorned in here just for the excuse of having an action scene. There are no stakes and it plays out pretty much exactly the same way as the barn fight earlier. It even ends the same way. Kill this now, generally I think Snyder is a pretty good director of action, but his style just doesn't work as well with guns. The slow motion and stylized shots are much better suited to close combat than to this sort of fighting, and that becomes really noticeable with this scene following on so closely from this fight. But I digress. After winning the fight, obviously, they meet up with Kai who has a ship and promises to help them recruit other warriors to their cause. And if you thought the writing and characterization was bad up until this point, well it tumbles off a cliff from this point onwards. See, a good team up movie like The Seven Samurai or Ocean's Eleven is built around an ensemble and every character bringing their own unique skill sets to the party, and the whole being better than the sum of its parts. This is very much what Snyder is going for with Rebel Moon. Dirty Dozen style story, being able to find a character to to puzzle piece in to each of the roles and to make a cohesive team. Unfortunately, what he ends up doing is having us meet a handful of badass characters who then vanish into the background for the rest of the movie once their singular scene is over. The first of these is Tarek, and oh man, I really knew we were in trouble when this scene began. See, Tarek is a slave and Korra can't afford to free him. So she makes a deal with the slaver that if Tarek can tame the hippogriff, sorry, the Bennu, then he's free. But if not, they all become his slaves. And they agree! Like, what? What is so indispensable about Tarek that they agree to even risk this? It's insane. Korra hasn't even met him. She's just going off the word of Kai, who she met like two minutes ago. This is literally all we have seen Korra learn about this guy. He has a man that might just work out for you. I think you'll like him. I'm no friend of the realm. That's well known. Gladly fight with you, but I have a debt on my name and I my debts. Can you write him? Yeah. We have seen nothing at all to convince us or the characters that this is a person so absolutely essential to their fight that they will risk slavery to recruit him. Remember, Gunnar and Kai aren't even particularly committed to Korra's rebellion, they're basically just taxi drivers at this stage. But they're apparently just completely fine with Korra risking everything for them without a single word of protest or questioning whether this is actually a good idea. Some of you may die. But it's a sacrifice I am willing to make. 
The stakes are just so insanely high here and nothing we or the characters have learned can convince me that they would willingly enter this bargain. Like in The Phantom Menace, Qui-Gon is willing to risk everything on Anakin because we have spent a long time establishing the fact that Qui-Gon can sense his importance, and also the level of faith he has in Anakin because of what the Force is telling him. But even then, he has characters question his judgement because even though they trust him, they're understandably nervous because they know he's taking a massive risk here. In Rebel Moon, Korra is just going off the word of some dude she met at the pub while Gunnar and Kai just stand there completely silently with zero purpose, agency or personality. They might as well not even be in the scene. So there's that, but then the scene itself is just excruciatingly bad dialogue from start to finish. What do we learn about Tarek? Well, don't worry, because like every character in the story, he just tells us who he is through cryptic phrases designed to make him seem more interesting than he actually is. What got that chain on your leg? A long road of mistakes. Wow, thanks for clearing that up. I feel like I know you so much better now. But you clearly took SNL's advice on how to be Don Draper a bit too seriously. When asked about your past, give vague, open-ended answers. What got that chain on your leg? A long road of mistakes. <sighs> how mysterious. Anyway, Tarek starts taming the Hippogriff and amazingly, not once in this entire scene did I think it had any similarity to Avatar. Nope, none whatsoever. Amazing. Oh, side note, but can someone please make a reaction gif out of this shot? Also, we're going to be coming back to it, but just remember this moment, okay? Anyway, entirely predictably, he tames the Hippogriff and is freed. And despite telling Buckbeak that he is more than the chains that bind him, Tarek is totally happy leaving him in the hands of the slaver. But that's okay, because also entirely predictably, Buckbeak eats the slaver, something Tarek clearly knew was going to happen. Had to go. So I wonder what the slaver's friends are going to do to the hippogriff that just killed their boss and presumably the person responsible for their livelihood. Will they kill it? Probably. I wonder if Tarek thought about that. Also going back a bit, but I wonder how long the slaver had this animal for and why he never made his slave tame it in the first place. Or if Tarek was so confident he could do it, why he never offered to settle his debt that way. Why do they all have to wait for Korra to show up? But look, those sound like difficult questions that someone who cared about story, character and world building might ask. Best not to think about them too much. It's not like this entire story is built around the idea of this world being massive with every detail fleshed out to the extent that Buckbeak, sorry, Beatrice, had a whole damn wiki page. If only some of that world building effort could be put into, you know, the characters that live in this world. Oh, by the way, this line. Had a girl. Yeah, that's Tarek's last line in the movie. Oh wait, no, sorry, I lie. He has like five more. Here they are. That was, that was amazing. Maybe this isn't suicide after all. They gave their lives for us. I know a thing or two about the guilt of carrying on when those you sworn to fight with are gone. <sighs> How mysterious. Honor them with everything that you can from now. Carry them. Uh, you thanks, Gunnar. You know, I never did trust that pilot. It's almost a shame you killed that son of a bitch noble and we don't have to fight. This would have been a beautiful place to die. Now you might say, yeah, but he was introduced halfway through the movie. Of course we didn't get time to develop him properly. Well, you know another character who was introduced halfway through a movie? Hello, what have we here? Tarek has about 11 to 12 minutes of screen time in Rebel Moon. Lando has just under 10 minutes in Empire. Which character do you think you know better? In fact, Tarek has more screen time in Rebel Moon than Darth Vader has in A New Hope. It's not the time, it's the writing. Anyway, like the movie itself does, we can move on from Tarek because we're off to meet the next character whose name is, um, uh... Nemesis, please, please. Hold her. Have Wait, what? Nemesis, please, please. Hold her. Have I didn't catch that. Nems? Unclear, but look, it doesn't matter because she's going to fight a giant spider. But just to go back a second, why is Kai the one talking to her? Why not Korra? Why is the protagonist, whose entire mission is to recruit people to her fight, not the one having this conversation? We are looking for warriors. Ah, uh, you know what, that sounds like another one of those annoying questions that is getting in the way of the monster fight. Now this is another relative high point in the movie and is an example of Snyder's style of directing action working well. This sort of close quarters fight where you really want to show the superhuman reflexes of the characters and emphasize cool moments like this one is the sort of scene where Snyder excels, as opposed to a scene where people just shoot guns across a tavern at each other. Plus the music here is probably my favourite track from the score. But the fight ends and this is the last time we hear this character speak. You would do well to remember that. Wait, no, sorry, she also says this. What will they do now? There we go. But really, this is her final line because it conveys the message we're meant to take away from her scene. There's no honour in this. 
This could easily be any of you lying here. In the name of revenge. This is reinforcing the line from the start. There is a difference between justice and revenge. It's an interesting message and one that actually works well within the theme of the story. It's played as quite a powerful moment with close-ups of the characters all reflecting on that idea, particularly Cora, who I'm sure can relate to the idea that revenge is not justice and is not worth dying for. Anyway, fast forward literally five minutes past yet another long-winded dump of exposition narrated to us over a flashback to Cora recruiting the next warrior. And how does she do it? Does she use her amazing powers of persuasion and leadership? Does she appeal to his humanity and sense of justice? Nope, she promises him revenge. If not redemption, what about revenge? There is a difference between justice and revenge. This example of the movie being confused about its messages and themes is particularly obvious because these scenes are pretty much one after the other. But it comes back to the fact that the entire premise of the film is flawed because Cora doesn't have a consistent set of principles. She's just saying whatever she needs to in order to recruit people. But we're getting ahead of ourselves because General Titus is probably the most poorly characterized person in this entire story, even though people are always talking about him. Time and time again we are told how he is a legendary warrior and commander. General named Titus, once a hero of the realm. The great General Titus. Are you not General Titus, a legend? General Titus, his actions at the Battle of Sarah will precede him. Now, we never see evidence of this, we just have to take everyone's word for it. But just to be clear, this is a legendary general. And again, after this scene, what do we see of him? Well, he has no lines at all until this monologue. It's the beginning of something. And he also says this. You still get paid, I presume? I've been wondering, is what that dead bounty hunter said true? That you're Athelius. Don't call me general. That's it. Those are his only lines after this scene. And this one is especially annoying. You still get paid, I presume? When was this ever about money for him? Payment wasn't even mentioned to Titus in the one other scene we have with him. So what tiny scrap of characterization that we had, that he was joining the fight to avenge his fallen soldiers, is undercut by a cheap joke about getting paid that's not even funny and makes no sense coming from Titus. Ah. Literally all we learn about this character in the entire movie is that he was a legendary general and the movie can't even keep that consistent. This isn't a one-off example by the way. In the same scene, Tarek says, You know I never did trust that pilot. What? When did this ever get established? They never share a scene. I hate you to think less of me. And also, this is played as a joke, like he kind of says it sarcastically. So even if we had established that Tarek had any sort of sense of humour, which we haven't, for that joke to work there would have needed to be a scene where he did show he trusted Kai. But there never is. This line just comes out of nowhere, makes no sense for the character, and isn't even funny. It just emphasises the lack of depth to these characters. Snyder just writes some lines, then distributes them among the characters without any thought as to what that character might actually say in this situation. But the reason for that is because that depth of character simply isn't there. Not even in Snyder's head. A good test of this is to watch Zack Snyder's trailer breakdown, where he gives us one or two sentence summaries of each character. Now I'm going to play that and then you tell me if we learn anything more about these characters in the movie itself than Snyder's summary. This character called Tarak, a super capable, super athletic sort of soldier. He doesn't have a shirt in the movie. His character doesn't own a shirt. Kai is a cool and great uh, person to have on your team because he's like a Swiss army knife. He's got all kinds of skills, including being an incredible pilot. Nemesis is a skilled swordswoman. Hey, her name is Nemesis. We learned something. Who uses his pair of special molten metal sword. She can also fight with them not on, and she does a lot of fighting before she turns them on because once she turns them on, they're kind of deadly. General Titus is a fierce gladiator whose reputation as an incredible military strategist is known throughout the universe. I think this is really telling, partly because the characters are so thin that a 15 word summary of them is as revealing about who they are as an entire movie, but it also shows how Snyder himself sees these characters. He's describing what they look like or attaches really broad adjectives to them. He's telling us what these characters are, not who they are. And that lack of depth is evident in the movie. Besides perhaps Cora and Kai, you cannot go any deeper with any of these characters than he doesn't own a shirt, or she has some cool swords that she turns on when she's really pissed off. This is Nemesis. She's got my back. She can cut all you and have with one sword stroke, just like mowing the lawn. That's what telling, not showing means. 
In team-up movies, each character gets recruited, then brings something new to the story or contributes to the team's mission. In Rebel Moon, they sign up, then stand around in the background while Korra talks to the next recruit. Like the Blood Axes, the final piece of the puzzle, the gang finally managed to meet the leaders of the actual rebellion. Now here, the Blood Axes react to Korra the same way she did at the start of the movie, by saying it would be suicide for them to fight the mother world head on. My force is against the king's gaze. That's suicide. Korra convinces them to do so anyway by guilt tripping them. His people toil with their bare hands to grow the grain that fed you. And because of that transaction, their village is now threatened. Now, I have a few problems with this. One, that's not why they are being threatened. As far as I can tell, Noble never actually finds out that Gunnar sold the grain to the revolutionaries. If he did, that would be an interesting conflict and would be an extra threat to the village. But he didn't. The village is under threat because Korra single-handedly decided to force them into a fight they didn't want to have. Now, if Korra had convinced the village to fight and appealed to their principles, their sense of right and wrong, and also their tacit opposition to the mother world, then this scene with the blood axes would be much better because they would see themselves as kindred spirits, united by a common purpose. There could be a nice parallel here with Korra agreeing with the blood axes that the fight is suicide something she herself believed, but that doing it anyway is the right thing to do because someone somewhere needs to take a stand and send a message. But as we know, Korra's character is nowhere near that well fleshed out and has nothing like this arc, so she has no way of convincing the Blood Axes to defend the village besides saying something that isn't actually true. And to be clear, I don't think this is the character knowingly manipulating the Blood Axes by bending the truth. I think it's just a writing and continuity error that came from the lack of consistency this entire story had, and the fact that Korra just believes and says whatever the plot needs her to in that scene. In fact, what Darian says to his troops is kind of the whole point I am making here. We will not stand with these defiant farmers in the revolution. It's meaningless. This is what the movie's central theme should be. This is the idea Korra should have at the heart of her journey, and what she should spend the movie convincing people of, starting with the village. But she doesn't because she's not an active player in the story, and instead another character has to say it as a way of convincing people who are already committed to the rebellion. For good measure, we'll throw in another ham-fisted attempt at character development for someone who will maybe be important in the next movie. Why am I not surprised? Who's going to make sure you'll return in one piece? Anyway, we're finally coming to the climax of the movie, when Kai betrays them all. Now, this would be a fun twist if it wasn't telegraphed a mile in advance by having him make them all travel to some random supply post so he can drop off some Amazon parcels or whatever. Conveniently, Korra seems to have forgotten this. Is he worth our time? Because we can't afford to waste any. Nope, never mind the time pressure, better help Kai make his delivery on time. Gee, I wonder if there could possibly be some other reason for making this stop. See, when your movie is just plot point after plot point, then you're not going to accept that this scene really is just about them dropping off some boxes. You're going to wonder if maybe the roguish, scoundrel character is not telling the whole truth. Color me surprised when this person turns out not to be trustworthy. But instead of using this scene to show us how each of these characters responds to being betrayed, instead we have more exposition and more one-line descriptions of each character. Tarek, for instance, has world enslaved. Then there was Nemesis, her whole family slaughtered. But General Titus, have you any idea how much he alone is worth? I mean, it's getting kind of exhausting at this point. I'd much rather see, for example, how Titus reacts to the fact that he was reluctant to rejoin the fight and is now proven right in that suspicion by being betrayed, or how Tarek, a former slave, might respond to being locked in chains again by the very person who freed him. But no, they just sit silently while Korra says things like, What happened to Honor? The bad guy arrives and guess what? He does exactly the same thing Kai just did and again goes around each character and tells us something about them. I feel like I am losing my mind. Tarek Decimus, or should I say Prince Tarek? <sighs> How mysterious. Commander Bloodax, leader of the very insurgency, the King's gaze was sent to this backwater of the galaxy to capture. General Titan, his actions at the Battle of Sarawu precede him. The legendary swordswoman known only by the name of Nemesis assassinated 16 high-ranking Imperial officers all in a hunt to avenge her slaughtered children. 
Do these characters get the chance to respond? Do we see how Darian Bloodax, the leader of the Rebellion, reacts to coming face to face with one of the Motherworld's most elite generals? Does Nemesis have anything to say to someone leading the regime that slaughtered her children? Of course not, because we need to start the fight. And finally, here we are, the climax of the movie. Korra has recruited the most fearsome warriors in the galaxy to her fight, and now we get to see them all team up and fight together for the first time. The entire movie has built towards this. Whatever flaws the characters had, this is the time to redeem them because this is what it has all been about. Let's start with Nemesis. <laughs> Oh, that's all Nemesis does? I thought we'd get slightly more of her. Maybe, I don't know, have her fight this guy from the start who also has a laser sword thing? Well, never mind. At least Tarek is here to show off his awesome athleticism. Oh, okay, he's using a gun. Oh, and he's done. That's it. That's everything we see him do in this scene. But what about General Titus? Surely, after an hour and a half of build-up of this legendary warrior, we finally get to see the truth of that. See what the legends are about. Oh, that's it. Wait, that, that can't be right. One shot of him just firing a gun? Nope, yep, that's it. That's all we see of the legendary General Titus in the final fight scene. This character who we met 10 minutes ago gets more screen time than he does in this fight. In fact, this random grunt also gets the same amount of screen time because he also appears in exactly one shot just firing a gun. But the main bit of this fight is Darian sacrificing himself to bring down the big ship. Now, this would mean more to us if we hadn't met him one scene earlier. His sacrifice is given this huge amount of significance. The music swells, there's slow motion, a character even yells. No! But we don't care because we don't know this character at all, so don't care about him or know what this means. We sideline the characters that we have at least attempted to be getting to know in favour of this guy getting all the glory. You know who should have done this? Tarek. You know, the guy who earlier in the movie did this? See, I told you I'd come back to this shot. To deviate from criticising the writing for a moment to criticise the filmmaking, this is one of my issues with the slow motion in Rebel Moon. I know it is a hallmark of Snyder's style, and that's fine. I think he does it well for the most part. But sometimes I think he gets so caught up in making stuff just look cool that he forgets the power of slow motion as a storytelling device. By using the same framing and filmmaking language, this moment of Tarek jumping on the hippogriff is given the exact same level of significance as Darian sacrificed at the end of the movie. One of them is so, so much more important to the story than the other, that this is not what Snyder is telling the audience because he just wants to have a cool slow motion shot of a dude jumping, ignoring the fact that the dramatic high point of the entire final battle uses exactly the same imagery. There are dozens of examples of this sort of thing in Rebel Moon, but this is the most obvious and frustrating for me. If Tarek had sacrificed himself here instead of Darian, then this would have worked as a really good bit of planting and payoff. You could even tie it back to the idea of him always paying his debts, because he's in debt to Korra for freeing him. I have a debt on my name, and I honor my debts. You know, tie it to his character somehow and give it some actual meaning, but no, it's just some other guy doing it while Tarek is shooting a gun. This whole battle is a missed opportunity. Like General Titus, the master tactician should be the one to identify the fact that they need to take out the gun tower, and should lead people accordingly. His reputation as an incredible military strategist is known throughout the universe. Maybe command Gunnar, the one with no fighting experience, to move the crane arm towards it. Maybe he and Darian could have Darian's soldiers provide covering fire while Nemesis runs ahead and, I don't know, cuts some power cables or something to let him do that. Then maybe it goes wrong and that's why Tarek decides to sacrifice himself. Maybe instead of killing Kai immediately, he and Gunnar or Korra could be having a smaller fight to the side, emphasising the difference between Kai being in it for the money and the others in it for their principles. There are so many ways this battle could be done in a way that made use of each character's skill set and have them work together and show us why Korra wanted to recruit them all to help defend her village. Instead, Tarek, Titus, Darian, Korra, Gunnar and this person are all just shooting guns while Nemesis is stabbing people. I mean, it's hardly the Battle of New York, is it? Anyway, Korra beats Noble, although surprise, she actually doesn't, and we have a whole epilogue just with him and the big bad guy, but like I said before, I actually think this fight is one of the stronger scenes in the movie. It's pretty well choreographed, and it feels brutal, and is a good way to end. Points for this. So mercifully, that's about the end of the movie, but not before we shoehorn in a bit more terrible dialogue. They believed in their cause. What better thing to die for? 
I won't even get into the fact that he didn't really die because he believed in his cause. I mean, he died to defend his soldiers, not to rebel against the mother world's tyranny. Because it's more annoying to have Tarek say, I know a thing or two about the guilt of carrying on when those you sworn to fight with are gone. Do you? Do you know that? Well, we the audience sure as hell don't know that. Gee, I can't wait for the sequel where we find out what the hell you mean by that and to find out more about your mysterious backstory. But maybe we won't find out in the sequel, maybe we'll find out in a prequel or a spin-off comic or a video game. Because ultimately that's what this movie feels like. It feels like an excuse to introduce half a dozen characters who can each go off and have their own series or spin-off and merchandise. But none of them earned this. I couldn't care less about a Titus spin-off or a Legends of Nemesis TV show because I know absolutely nothing about them and don't care for them at all. When you watch interviews with the cast, you can tell how passionate they are about these roles. They talk endlessly about all the notes and backstory they had from Snyder, and I am very confident that they know these characters inside out and could recite all of the lore associated with them. But I'll say it again for the thousandth time, backstory is not character. It doesn't matter one bit how well you know your character's origin story. What matters is whether or not the story being told uses that character in an interesting way, makes them have some sort of conflict or clash of values with the other characters and in doing so allows them to develop and change in some way. You know what we learn about Boromir's backstory and fellowship? Fuck all. But he's probably the most interesting character in the entire movie. Because Sean Bean and the writers used their knowledge of the character to inform how they portrayed him reacting to events in the story that test and challenge his character. Rebel Moon had the opportunity to build these characters and this world in the same way, and make us get to know and like these characters for who they are and what they do in this story, not because of their mysterious past. But it's baiting us with the promise of more to come, that maybe there is more world building to come in some other future story instead of giving us something now. But because all of the characters and dialogue in this movie are so shallow and so boring and cliched and poorly drawn out, I just don't believe it. I don't believe we are ever going to learn more about any of these people. I mean sure, we might learn more of their backstory, why he's called a prince, or how Titus ended up in the Colosseum. But say it with me now, backstory is not character. I don't want to know what. I want to know why. I want to know what drives these characters, what they agree and disagree about, where there is conflict between them, what their principles are. An ensemble only works when the characters have different motives, personalities, and perspectives. These stories become interesting when these things clash with each other, and the team have to learn to overcome their differences to fight the common enemy. But I know absolutely nothing about any of these people. All we have seen of them is that every single one of them is a reluctant, stoic badass distinguished only by the fact that they look different. Not once in this entire movie do any of the ensemble interact with each other. I mean hell, they only interact with Korra in their introductory scenes, so for the rest of the movie we have no idea what they want, how they treat each other, and where the tension is going to come from. I have no idea why any of them, except maybe the Blood Axes, would want to abandon everything they have to fight for some random village besides a vague resentment for the space Nazis. I have no idea why Korra thinks five strong warriors and a handful of guys in ships will be enough to fight a dreadnought that can do this, and their value is even less clear to me after seeing them all just fight like regular, normal soldiers in the final battle. And above all, I have no confidence that either part 2 or the director's cut will explore any of these questions in any more depth than the theatrical version did, because Snyder himself can't think of anything to say about these characters besides describing what they look like and calling them legendary. Because even Rebel Moon's claims of deep world building and centuries of lore are still just surface level in the movie itself. We actually learn very little about this universe. After we leave Velt, we get a single, generic establishing shot of whatever planet the characters happen to be on before immediately moving inside to a bland, equally generic looking sci-fi set, none of which have any personality or uniqueness to them. The characters never interact with the environments or the sets. The planet they are on at any given time is never a character in and of itself, and never impacts the story in any way. We never meet or see anyone who lives on any of these planets or learn anything about these places other than, you guessed it, a single sentence describing what it is. If you swapped all of these locations around, the movie would play out in exactly the same way. Could you say the same for Cloud City and Hoth? Like I said at the very start of this video, I am not opposed to simple, generic genre pieces. I don't go and see a movie like The Meg or Transformers expecting anything more than what it promises to be. A bit of mindless action that knows exactly what it is. But Rebel Moon is not that. 
Rebel Moon is not a movie that winks at the audience and says, yeah, we know this is a bit dumb, just enjoy it. No, Rebel Moon presents itself as this deep, rich mythology, the start of a legend with promises of immense world building and aeons of lore to delve into. But the movie simply does not live up to that vision in the slightest. Rebel Moon is the most shallow, uninspired and generic story with some of the most basic and uninteresting characters I have seen in a movie of this scale, and yet it portrays literally every moment with so much over the top sincerity and sense of significance that it all ends up being meaningless. When every moment is super, none of them are. Every single thing Rebel Moon does is tell us things. It never shows them. And the reason it annoyed me so much that I made this ridiculously long video about it is because it could have been so much better. Snyder is capable of better. This could have been something brilliant. All it needed was for a writer with experience handling proper ensemble stories to join the screenwriting team and help Snyder turn his vision into a story that actually had something to say. Instead, we're just left with this muddled, confused mess of a story that, above all, just left me frustrated that there was a perfect opportunity here for a prominent, popular director with a strong vision to bring us a brand new sci-fi series, and it was just completely and utterly let down by the execution. So if you'll excuse me, I'm going to return to the Rebel Moon that I do enjoy. If you made it this far, feel free to leave a comment with what you thought of Rebel Moon, and remember, I'll post a review of the director's cut on my Patreon page once it comes out, so make sure you check that out because I promise it won't be easy for me to sit through this movie yet again. Thanks for watching, and as always, a special thank you to my patrons.